Good morning. Good morning. It's a wonderful day to be here and worship our Lord and Savior this morning. It's good to see every one of y'all. A uh, note for y'all, I need you this afternoon to grab your husband, grab your wife, grab your kids. You can pinch them twice, but bring them to the fish fry tonight. Uh, need to get as many of y'all out there as we can because we got a lot of food we're going to cook up. So uh, if you need directions, uh, we can get those to you afterwards. They were on the screen earlier, but we'll get them to you afterwards. So let's stand this morning and worship our Lord and Savior. Let's praise our God with our voices and sing, Brethren, we have come to worship. I also want to welcome you as we come together to worship the Lord this morning. As we just sang, uh, we are called here uh, together to, uh, to worship, uh, but also to be actively involved, to pray, uh, and uh, to, uh, to ask God's blessing on our meeting here uh, together today. Uh, we do want to welcome you. We want to, uh, and by way of announcement, we want to, uh, to wish you a happy 4th of July. Uh, we are uh, thankful that God has, in his mercy and his grace, uh, put us in this particular nation at this particular time. Uh, we have uh, historically and even now uh, enjoyed freedoms uh, that uh, many parts of the world have, have not enjoyed. So uh, we are thankful to God for this country and for uh, placing us as individuals and as families and even more so as a church family uh, in, uh, in this place. Uh, we will not have Wednesday night activities this week uh, due to the holidays. Uh, and so please be aware of that. We will not, uh, not have Wednesday night church. Um, that we do have, as has been announced, a church supper tonight. We're going to celebrate together, uh, and uh, that will be at 6.30 at the Potts House. Uh, that is correct, in 6.30? Okay, thank you. Um, 
and then there will be fireworks to follow the meal uh, as soon as it's dark, sometime between 8.30 and 9. Uh, so uh, please bring lawn chairs and plan on, plan on staying and, and having a, a time of fellowship uh, with your church family um, this evening. Uh, we do want to welcome our newest member, uh, Ian Reinhardt, joined the church. There you go, Ian, thank you. Joined the church last week after church on profession of his faith in Christ. Uh, gave a clear testimony uh, of God's grace in his life. Um, Ian will be baptized uh, next Sunday uh, as part of our uh, morning worship. And so I uh, would uh, want you to be aware of that and would certainly invite you to uh, make plans to be here next Sunday uh, and support uh, Ian uh, as he uh, is baptized and joins, uh, joins the church. Uh, we will have elder and deacon elections on uh, Sunday, August 8th. Uh, and so if you have uh, men that you would like to nominate for uh, for either one of those positions, please see Carl and, uh, and give that nomination to him. Uh, and we will announce those uh, uh, who's been nominated. Uh, those nominations will close uh, two weeks before, uh, before the election. So uh, please be aware of that and um, be praying about uh, who uh, you want to nominate. Um, if you have been nominated, someone, uh, one of the elders or myself, will speak with you about that. And, and, uh, and if you have been nominated, please be praying um, on, on, uh, on whether or not um, you want to accept that nomination. Are there other announcements that need to be made this morning? Again, I welcome you. I would invite your attention to the screen. The meditation passage for this morning is Psalm 133 verses 1 through call to worship uh, is Psalm 105. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders, glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face continually. Remember his wonders which he has done, his marvels, and the judgments uttered by his mouth. O seed of Abraham, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He has remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. And then he confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are the, the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. That you choose to enter into a, a covenant relationship with your chosen ones. Um, God, we thank you uh, that, that we are yours in Christ. Um, God, we thank you for the chance to, to be here together, called to this place this morning, uh, to, uh, to come together to worship you together in a way that we cannot worship you uh, individually alone. 
And so, God, I, I pray that, uh, that your sons and daughters would be encouraged and strengthened this morning. Um, God, I pray that in your grace and your mercy, you would even draw people to yourself today. Uh, we pray most of all, again, that you would be pleased and glorified and honored and worshipped here. Uh, you are so worthy of our worship, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing hymn 437, The Church is One Foundation. <clears throat> church is one foundation is jesus christ her lord she is his new creation by water and the word from heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride with his own blood he bought her and for her life he died elect from every nation yet one or all the earth her charter of salvation one lord one faith one birth one holy Takes one holy food, and to one hope she presses with every grace endued. Mid toil and tribulation, and to tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest yet she on earth hath you with God the three in one and mystic sweet communion for those whose rest is one. Oh, happy ones and holy Lord give us grace that we like them the meek and low We've begun to consider the moral law in our study of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and we'll continue to look this morning at the first commandment. And in keeping uh, with our understanding of the Ten Commandments as the moral law summarily comprehended, right? So thinking of each commandment as a sort of heading with underneath each of them all that the Scripture teaches, all that the moral law speaks about, uh, on, on certain headings, certain topics, then it's important for us to understand that for each thou shalt not, there are going to be corresponding thou shalt. And we're seeing that. In last week's question, question 46, which was what is required in the first commandment, in this week's question, question 47, if you'll kindly bring that up for us now, what is forbidden in the first commandment? Well, the first commandment forbiddeth the denying or not worshiping and glorifying the true God as God and our God, and the giving of that worship and glory to any other which is due to him alone. So we have a fairly wordy and technical answer, as the Westminster divines often uh, were uh, in their 
commitment to precision in language, right? But we can break down and reduce down the sins that are forbidden here to two general headings. There's atheism and idolatry. So I won't ask for a show of hands. Atheists and idolaters in, in attendance this morning. Um, atheism is defined as denying or not having a God. And there are at least two types of atheism that we continually see. The first is what theologians call speculative atheism. And this is the one that may come to your mind. It's recognized as a fixed persuasion in the heart and an open profession with the mouth that there is no God. And these kinds of atheists are common in the world, but they're admittedly uncommon among church members. The second type of atheist, however, is the most common, and it's nearly as often encountered in the church as without. And we call that type of atheism practical atheism. Uh, this is the person who's spoken of in Titus 1.16, those who profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. So to be a practical atheist is to simply to, it's to live as though there is no God, or as our catechism states, denying or not worshiping and glorifying the true God as God. So there are a lot of ways that this can show up. I mean, it can just be as simple as when we woke up this morning and we went and we looked into our closet, did it come into our minds, what would be honoring to the Lord this morning for me to wear? Right? Or did we just get dressed not really thinking about God? And when we got into our cars and we drove to church and some guy cut us off, did we think, what would be the honoring way to, to deal with this? Or did we, just deal, did we just drive without thought of God? Well, that's to live as a practical atheist. Um, there's another way that this can show up. When we deny God's essential attributes as they've been revealed to us in his word, then we create a God of our own liking in our minds, and we become practical atheists because we deny and we fail to worship and to glorify the true God as God. So bad theology cannot help but lead to practical atheism. But notice that worship is inextricably connected to the first commandment as well. We'll talk about worship a lot in the second commandment, but when we refuse to look into God's revealed word to see how he's instructed us to worship him, and instead we do what seems right in our own eyes, we are guilty of breaking the first commandment because we fail to worship and glorify the true God as God, which places us in the camp of the practical atheist, those who live as though there were no true God who's revealed his character and his worship in his word. So, believer, I would ask that as we study the catechism this week, uh, that we ask ourselves whether we're in need of repentance as those who profess that we know God, but in our works, in our life, or in our worship, we deny him and, and live or are prone to live as practical atheists. Also forbidden in the first commandment is the sin of idolatry, which is defined as the giving of that worship and glory to any other which is due to God alone. And Reformed theologians have uh, distinguished idolatry into that which is external and immediately obvious, or the old word for that was gross. You see it immediately. That's, this person is clearly an idolater. And that which is more refined and more internal. So the Westminster men placed the heathen and the papist into the first category of gross idolatry, right? Those who bow to images and altars and who make little statues of stone and wood and they worship those. Um, we probably don't do that. Uh, the other category is common to all men in all places, and it's the one that the Apostle John warns the church about. In 1 John 5, 21, where he says, My dear children, my little children, guard yourselves from idols. So this is the setting up of idols in the heart that God speaks about in Ezekiel 14. It's giving the esteem and the affection of our hearts, which God alone ought to possess, to any other person 
or thing. And the most dangerous idol there is that idol of self, right? In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. And that looks like a lifelong turning to Christ and turning away from the self-sins. You know the self-sins. Self-wisdom. I know what's right. I don't need to consult the scriptures to see what's right. Self-will. I will do what's right in my own eyes. I don't need to see what the scripture says about this. And the most insidious and the most common, sadly, among religious people like us is self-righteousness. I'm a pretty good person, you know, deep down. Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. So why do we study the moral law? Well, our larger catechism gives us three reasons. It says that the moral law is of use to all men, one, to inform them of the holy nature and will of God and of their duty binding them to walk accordingly. Two, to convince them of their disability to keep the moral law and of the sinful pollution of our nature and our hearts and our lives. When I asked, you know, jokingly for a show of hands for atheists and idolaters this morning, you know, maybe after looking at it in a little bit more detail, we might be inclined to say, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm guilty of that. Um, you know, the Ten Commandments, there's some in there that we think, okay, I'm good on that one, right? But when we look into the perfect law of God's perfect law, the perfect mirror, I should say, of God's perfect holy law, we see ourselves as we really are because we see God's perfections. But we don't do that only so that we can you know, have an accurate view of ourselves. That's part of it. But the third reason we study the moral law is to humble us in a sense of our sin and misery and thereby help us to a clearer sight of the need that we have of Christ and of his perfections and the perfection of his obedience on our behalf. So if you look into the perfect mirror of God's moral law and you see yourself as someone who's perpetually guilty of breaking it, you're doing it right. That's what it's for. That's what it's supposed to do. But that's not all that it's supposed to do. Let it, don't stop there. You know, let it point you again and again to the beauty and the perfection of Christ's obedience on your behalf. And as Spurgeon said, I have a great need for Christ, and I have a great Christ for my need. So let's say our question 47, the answer together. What is forbidden in the first commandment? The first commandment forbiddeth the denying or not worshiping and glorifying the true God as God and our God, and the giving of that worship and glory to any other which is due to him alone. As we go to the Lord in prayer, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to encourage us from, uh, from Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 20, uh, and then also read from 1 Timothy. Uh, again, as we already stated, it, it is a blessing to live in this country. Uh, it is more of a blessing to be citizens of of heaven. It is more of a blessing. It is a greater blessing to be part of Christ's church, uh, to be part of God's family. Uh, and so as, again, as excited and, and, and rightfully so, uh, excited that, and thankful that God has placed us in this place, it is even more important that he has placed us in this place and placed us in his church and in the church. Uh, so I want, to, I want to read from Philippians 3.20 uh, as we go to the Lord in prayer. So let's pray. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. And then from 1 Timothy 2. First of all, then, I urge that in entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God, we thank you for the reminder from your word that because of Christ and in Christ, we are citizens first and foremost in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We look forward to the day that you will transform uh, this this body, this this humble state into conformity uh, with your image. Um, And so, God, we... Uh, We thank you and praise you. We thank you for for placing us in this place uh, at this time uh, to be used by you. Um, And God, I pray you would give us great joy in what you've called us to. And God, we do want to do what you command us in your word to do, and that is to to pray for those that are in authority over us. Um, And God, we thank you again for this nation, and we thank you for uh, the leadership that you have placed at this point. And God, I pray that you would do, as you say in 1 Timothy 2.4, that you would save many. Um, God, I pray uh, for our president. Uh, I pray for our vice president. Um, God, I pray for their cabinet. Um, God, I pray for uh, our senators and our congressmen. Um, God, I pray that you would strengthen and encourage uh, and guard believers in in that group, um, that, um, that you would guard them from the evil one, from the attacks of the enemy. Um, And God, I pray that you and your grace and your mercy, I pray that you would draw many of those government leaders to yourself, even even while they're serving. Um, God, I pray that you would uh, draw them to yourself. Um, And and I pray by your grace and your mercy, you would even uh, that you would even show that grace and mercy to our entire nation uh, as you. Uh, draw the leadership to yourself. God, we pray for our state leaders. We pray for our local leaders in the towns where we live, in in this uh, city where we worship. God, I pray uh, for them that, again, you would draw uh, those those leaders to yourself. Um, God, we do pray that you would be uh, gracious and merciful to our nation. God, I pray that you would bring revival. I pray that you would turn the hearts of men and women and children uh, to you. Uh, And God, I thank you for your church, and I thank you for the church that you have placed in this nation at this time. And God, I pray that you would protect us as the church and us as this church from, uh, from our own selfishness, from the idolatry of self that we just talked about. God, I pray you would cause us to turn from that and turn to you. Um, And God, I pray that you would give us uh, the joy of being used by you to bring glory to you uh, in this place. Um, God, we pray for uh, many in our church body that are suffering, uh, that are suffering uh, physically. God, we pray for little Anna Reese this morning. And God, we we know that she is suffering and we know that um, uh, that that um, she needs your strength, God. I pray that that you would calm her. I pray that whatever reaction she's having right now would uh, would would fade, would cease, God. I pray that uh, that she could she could rest calmly. Um, God, we pray for your your grace and your mercy to her uh, and to her family. Um, God, we pray for many in our church body that are suffering physically. 
And we ask that you would encourage them and strengthen them. Um, God, we, uh, we thank you for the chance to, to bring uh, to you our, our, our prayers, our thanksgiving, our praise. You are so good to us. We pray that you would be pleased again with our worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing, Be Thou My Vision, and then remain standing for a praise chorus. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her. When the morning dawns. <clears throat>
God, we acknowledge that the fiercest battle that we face day by day is turning from the idol of self uh, and turning to the true God each day, even as believers. And so, God, we thank you that you are in control and that you are strength and you are our shelter and you are protection, even uh, most of all from our own sinfulness and from the attacks of the evil one. Uh, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me see. I would invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. The scripture reading for this morning is Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. God, I pray you would teach us from your word. I pray you would encourage us, strengthen us. Um, God, I pray that you would cause us to love you more. And God, I pray uh, that you would use this teaching time in each of our lives. Uh, We commit this time to you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, By way of a a quick review and introduction to to this section, um, back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus made a promise to his disciples. And the promise was, you shall receive power. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And with that power, you will be my witnesses, first here and, and then a little bit and then, and then to the entire earth. You are going to be my witnesses because you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I promise you that. And then in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Jesus referred to the promise of the Holy Spirit as what God the Father had promised. And after waiting, and and we've talked about this in chapter 2, verse 1, on the day of Pentecost, in the place where the disciples and others were, uh, there was the sound of a violent wind, and and something as of tongues of fire, flames of fire, rested on, on the apostles' heads, and they could instantly, suddenly speak in other tongues, other known languages. These were three signs that chapter 2, verse 4 had occurred that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately after that, because of those signs, a crowd gathers and Peter begins to preach. And Peter explains what the people are seeing, first of all, by saying in chapter 2, verse 17, uh, that this was, this was foretold by the Old Testament prophets by God saying, I will pour forth my spirit on mankind. And then in verse 19, I will grant wonders and signs. And then in verse 21, and everyone in that context of me pouring forth my spirit and the wonders and the signs, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then Peter explained the gospel in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 24, the fact that Jesus was from God attested to you by God, by these signs and wonders that he performed, and you killed him, you caused his death. And then in verse 24, and God raised him from the dead. The the gospel simply stated, Jesus was from God, and you killed him, and God raised him from the dead. This Jesus Peter said, who is both Lord, the sovereign God of the universe, and Christ, the sent one, the Messiah, the Savior, the the salvation of his people. The end of that sermon, the people ask in chapter 2, verse 37, what shall we do? And Peter's response to them in verse 38 was repent 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent. Turn away from your sin and turn to your Savior. Turn to the one who's saving you. And in doing that, turn away from your sin. As an outward expression of that, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And the promise there was in verse 38, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For verse 39, this promise, the context there, salvation, forgiveness, forgiveness of your sins and the Holy Spirit, this promise shall be for all those that the Lord our God is calling to himself. Every single one that God is calling to himself is going to receive this promise, the promise of salvation and forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 41, those who received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. There's a possibility that there were... uh, up to 120 total people there in the, in, the, in the room, in the place when the Holy Spirit came on the apostles. And it would seem anyway that, that those people were, were already, whatever you want to call it, already in. They were, they were part. And so at the end of that sermon, the church explodes from, from 120 to 3,120. Uh, and... and, and and this is the beginning, if you would, of this, this thing called the church. And it's a, a sudden, explosive start. Uh, it's the start of spiritual life, of new life for each one of these people because they had received salvation, they received forgiveness, and they had received, we're told here, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so what happened to those folks right there when they received the Holy Spirit? Because the promise was when they, when they uh, received salvation, when they received forgiveness, when they, we, we would say, got saved, when they were saved, when they received salvation, they would receive at that same time the Holy Spirit. And so what were the signs that that 3,000 group had received the Holy Spirit? You know, was, was there the sound of the, the, the rushing wind? Was there the fire coming out of the top of their heads? Were they instantly, suddenly, miraculously able to speak other known languages? And the answer is no. Those signs, those particular Pentecostal signs were very rare and very specific and only happened a, a, a couple times in the book of Acts as God was doing a a much more specific thing. And and so there were other signs here. There's no indication that any of those 3,000 suddenly began to speak in tongues. There's no indication there was a sound of a wind or there was flame on their heads, but there were other signs. There's some new signs, not not wind, not not fire, not, not speaking in tongues, but some other signs of the presence of God in the person of the Holy Spirit here in verses 42 through 47. Some more signs, if you would, of the Holy Spirit. Again, I think if we're honest, it would be kind of cool to be in a service where suddenly there was a a wind in the service. I mean, I think it would be terrifying, but I think it would be cool. And I really do think it would be cool to be somewhere where Whoever is teaching, head caught on fire, and they kept on teaching. And it would be so incredible to be able to suddenly speak other known languages and have whoever was there understand you in the language to which they were born. And I'm pretty sure those things are not going to happen here, and they're not going to happen here this morning. But these other signs of the Holy Spirit can happen here. And by God's grace, they do happen here. And they can happen here even more. There's more signs of the, the Holy Spirit. Verse 42, and they were continually devoting themselves. They were actually continually devoting themselves to several things. These, these 3,000 new, this, this new group, this, this new community of faith. They were continually devoting themselves 
continually. The word there is daily and many times repeatedly. They were continually. Listen, it was not something that started and then quickly wore off. Or it's not something that quickly burned out or quickly faded away. They were continually devoting themselves. They were focused. They were disciplined to. They were committed to several things. In verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. To the authoritative biblical teaching to the teaching of God's word by God's servants, the apostles, to God's people. They were devoting themselves to the teaching of God's word. The book of Acts tells us in, in verse 1 and 2, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it alludes to anyway, that the book of Luke, the gospels, are what Jesus began to do and teach while he was on the earth. The book of Acts is what Jesus continues to do and teach through the apostles. The teaching of God's word was an emphasis. It was a value. They were devoted to it. Some psalms about God's word, familiar from our, our long look at the book of Psalms. In Psalm 19, verse 7, may God in his grace work in us that we could honestly say these things. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. They are valuable. Psalm 119, speaking of God's word. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the night, all the day. Verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. They are sweeter than honey to my mouth. A love for God's word marked these people. Y'all listen. The, the, the group receive salvation. I don't know, I don't know what their, their, their spiritual journey was before that, but the day that, they got, that, they, that God added to their number, the day that those 3,000 people received salvation, they were devoted to, they had a love for God's word, a devotion to God's word. Verse 42 says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. To fellowship, to spending time with other believers. Now, fellowship does involve eating. It does involve eating, or that's one of the things it involves. Fellowship involves serving. It involves service. It involves working together. There, there is a, a, a chance to serve together with other believers, to, to be together. You guys, there's a group of people that you've worked with. And to be honest with you, lots of times, the folks that you work with at work, you have a, a bond with them. That to be honest with you, we have to work hard here to have a stronger bond than you do with the folks at work. Because there is a real sense of fellowship when you're working together. I don't know if when you drove in, I would assume when you drove in this morning, you saw the colorful playground out there and you thought, wow, what happened? All right, now, if you have young people with you, you probably had to say, no, not right now, not yet, not yet, not yet. After church, maybe after church. There was a group of eight or ten guys. I was not involved in that group, uh, so I'm not, I, I, but there was a group of eight or ten men that, that, that put that, uh, put that, together yesterday, and I believe it, it, I believe it was about a four-hour experience 
Uh, and, and there was lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of parts that came together into one part. And I, I listen, at the end of it, and you know this is true, at the end of it, you kind of nod your head at each other. And there is a bond that you have because you worked together on that. And there's a bond that you have with those guys that the rest of us don't have with y'all right now. If you come here and serve on Wednesday night at the end of it when you're sitting there just wasted and, and, and you're thinking, you know, I'm going to sleep all day tomorrow, all right, there is a bond that you have when you look around at the other folks doing the exact same thing because they're also tired. There's a, a chance to serve together. There's a, a, a chance to work. There's a chance to be together, to actually Want to be together. Fellowship. Psalm 1-1 how, how, tells us how blessed is the man listen, whose fellowship is with the righteous and not with the wicked and with sinners and with scoffers. Psalm 27, verse 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Psalm 133, verse 1. How good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. A love for a desire to be with God's people. Now listen, that is a, that's a sign of the presence of God working in us. You do know it's, it's also a sign when you cannot stand being around God's people that, that that is evidence that there is something wrong. Either you're not a believer or you are a believer that is in rebellion against God at that time and you don't want to be around the righteous. I feel more comfortable with the wicked. A love for a devotion to God's people. Verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They were continually devoting themselves to the breaking of bread. The, the terminology there is the, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. They were continually devoting themselves to the, the communion ritual. Now, y'all listen, the communion, the Lord's Supper at this point right here is two months old. It, it, the, whole, the whole ceremony, the, I don't know how many times they've done it, but the ritual, if you want to call it that, is two months old. It had to be fresh in the disciples' minds how on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he, he broke it. He tore it. And as he handed it to them, he said to them, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took a cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. How amazing. We've talked about this before. It would have been to have the Lord's Supper and have the Lord serving the Lord's Supper. When we do the Lord's Supper, when we have, not do, when we have the Lord's Supper here, when we have communion here, we actually say, you know, I speaking for him, I in his place, I hand these things. How great, and, 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 the, and the elders go up and, and down the aisles and we, and we hand the Lord's Supper to you. How fresh and how amazing and how overwhelming it would have been for the disciples to have the Lord hand them the Lord's Supper. And that was only two months. That ceremony was, 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 again, was overwhelming, and it was a focus of their daily lives. It was a focus of their daily lives. It was a focus of their times together. It says they continually devoted themselves to prayer, to individual prayer, to family prayer, to corporate prayer. Psalm 5, speaking of prayer, in Psalm 5, verses 1 through 3. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Heed the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray, in the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. The, a sign of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. They loved communion with God. 
They loved the Lord's Supper. They loved and devoted themselves to prayer. It was a focus of their times together. It was a focus of their daily lives. It says here in verse 43, and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. The actual literal there is everyone had fear that occurred in every soul. There was a fear, a sense of the presence of God. And the proper response to a sense of the presence of God is a little bit, not a little bit, a proper fear. There should be a little bit of fear when we see God working here. Because when, when, God, when God works, let's just bow, we're not sure what that's going to look like when he gets done. We're not sure what that's going what, to, what, 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 when God shows us himself, he, he, and we pray that God show us more of you, he's going to show us more of us. And he's going to call us to repentance. And, and there was a, a fear, a sense of awe. And it says here, I love this, many wonders and signs were taking place for the apostles. Many wonders and signs. That's all it says about the apostles right here. Many wonders and signs were taking place. In other words, those guys were still doing miracles. The actual word there for, for signs is attesting miracles. God gave the apostles in particular some apostolic gifts, and they could do miracles. And those miracles were attesting. They, they, they gave some evidence to the apostles' teaching. And there's one verse right here about that. There's one phrase in the verse. And the apostles could do miracles. And then it goes back to the folks that are not apostles. Verse 44 and verse 45. Now you talk about a sign of the Holy Spirit. It says, all those who believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and their possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Now, if the book of Acts is prescriptive about worship, and I'm not saying it's not, then maybe it's prescriptive about life. And what the believers did was they sold everything and brought all their stuff, and then they just distributed it as anyone had amongst them had need. Let me tell you again what they did. They sold all their stuff. They sold their property. It says they sold their property and their possessions. And, and, and they had all things in common. You understand what God has, has done here? God had, by the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, God has, has taken these 3,000 folks and made them a family. And you do know that about family. I would assume in your family, I would assume in your family, there, you guys... There are certain things you borrow from family members without even asking. I would assume there's other things you borrow without asking and that gets you in trouble. But I would also assume that there are things that you, and, and, and some of y'all, some of y'all have extended family that live kind of on a commune and you're all right there, you know, kind of, kind of together. And I would assume that the lawnmower over here, even though it belongs to so-and-so, it really kind of belongs to the family. My, my, my three oldest uh, children live within less than a mile of each other in Midland. And I do know that even though there's three separate houses and three separate households, there is a collective pile of stuff. And, and it, there's no, I mean, we were working on something, and I said, do you have whatever the tool was? And they said, no, nah, but Zach's got it. And there was not even a, hey, should we call? It was, I'm just going to go get it because, listen, we are family. And it, there's an understanding that what's mine is yours and what yours is mine. The church is family to the point that for those that have need, if I have what you need, and you need it, it should be in my. It should be. It should be understood that of course you can have. These guys were living out James chapter two, verse fifteen and sixteen. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, "Go in peace." 
Be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How do you do that? Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him. How does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now, y'all listen. I am not saying go home and sell all your stuff. Not that any of y'all were going to do that anyway. But we could pray that God would work in us an understanding of family, an understanding of what it means to be brothers and sisters in Christ. That if somebody in the family needs my stuff, needs my resources, needs my time, needs my... You talk about turning from the idol of self. If God could work this in us, because the idol of self tells me, I need my time. I need my resources. I need a bigger pile of stuff just in case. Yeah, I, don't, I realize you don't have anything, but I need a bigger pile. If God could work that in us. A, a, an evidence of the Holy Spirit, a sign of the Holy Spirit was a, as, they, as they loved God's word and as they loved communion with God, they lost their love for stuff and for possessions. Verse 46, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple. Continuing with one mind, meeting together as one family, corporate worship, and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Day by day, they met together. Day by day, they broke up into smaller groups and went from house to house. You understand, they, they, had, they had corporate worship, and then they had small groups. There's no, nobody had a house where 3,000 folks came over to the house. And, yet, and so day by day, they were meeting in houses, and, and they were taking their meals together, and they were fellowshipping, and they were spending time together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Verse 47, they were praising God. They were praising God. They were worshiping together a love for God's worship, for God's glory, for God's honor, with gladness and sincerity of heart. They were glorifying God and enjoying him. Verse 47, and we're done. It says they were having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. They were having favor with the people. People could see a difference. People could see a change. People knew by their love for each other that they were Jesus' disciples. People saw and understood, or at least began to understand, that these guys were acting as salt and light, and God was using them by God's grace and God's mercy, to add day by day those that he was saving, those that he was calling to himself. By God's grace and God's mercy, God's already working these, he's already working these signs in us. He's already working these signs. By God's grace and God's mercy, let us pray that God would work these particular signs in us here in this place. Let's pray. God, I thank you for these signs, which we would even consider, though, though they, they seem encouraging, and they are, and though they seem like, wow, that would be a, a great church to be a part of, and it would. Those signs are what we would consider regular a work, of, a work of God, a work of the, the presence of God in people's lives. And God, we pray for that in each one of us. I pray you'd give me a, a, a love for your word and a love for communion with you and a, and a love for the Lord's Supper and a, and a love for the chance to worship and a love for your people and, and, a, and a love for, for coming together and being with each other. And less of a love for my stuff and myself. But God, I thank you for the encouragement that, that you are and have done those things here in the past. And you're doing those things now. 
And God, I pray that you would continue in, 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 a, in a fresh way, God. I pray you'd work in each one of us that are believers, that are yours, that are in Christ. And God, I pray again, if there are those here, even this morning, that are not, I pray today you would add to our number those that you are calling to yourself. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to worship, let's stand and we'll sing, Blessed be the tie that binds him 473. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims, our one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual bear and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear from sorrow toil and pain and sin we shall be free and purge love and friendship reign through all eternity. Blessings on you this morning from our great God who has called us to himself and to his church. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.